So, well, I'm going to present Maria. is a Lacanian psychoanalyst, member of the Lacanian Compa, Associated Group of NLS. Her publications have appeared in the International Lacanian Review, the Lacanian Compass, Psychoanalytical Notebooks, Cuarto, Echos, and Lacanian Addiction, an anthology. She holds a doctorate. Today we have two doctors, two PhDs, a degree in clinical psychology and a master's degree in mental health. She completed her undergrad work in anthropology and sociology. She has been working with children and adults in the autism spectrum for over 20 years in com community settings and private practice in Miami, Florida. Leon Brenner is a philo philosopher and psychoanalyst uh, theorist from Berlin. He's currently a lecturer at the International Psycho Psychoanalytic University and a research collaborator of Ghent University. He participates in the activities of Initiative Berlin associated link to the NLS. His work focuses on psychoanalytic theory of subjecti subjectivity and the understanding of the relationship between culture and psychopathology. His book, The Autistic Subject on the Threshold of Language, was published by uh, published with the um, Palgrave Lacan series in 2020. I will copy his website on the chat so you can visit his website with more information. So before starting, so I, I, starting, yeah, Maria, if you can mute yourself, please. Oh, yeah, that was important. If everybody can mute yourself, that's, that was this part that I was going to, to say. Uh, so, so first, um, I, the, the logic of the presentation is that Leon will start his presentation and then Maria, We'll continue with uh, cases, and then we uh, we will open up the question for discussion. Discussion. So you can make the question on the chat or raise your your hands with a little you know hand that that uh, Zoom allows. Um, so please, uh, during all the presentation, uh, have your uh, your microphone turned off, unless you are unmuted. Uh, by me to make your questions. If you raise your hand or you ask a question on the chat, okay? So thank you so much. Welcome, Leon, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Ines. I'm really happy to, um, to uh, come to this event. It's amazing uh, I can participate in an event in Toronto so easily. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, I'll have to come and visit at another time. Yeah. Um, Ines, you kindly mentioned the website and you posted it. Yes, it's a, yeah, the best place to get in touch with me and uh, and talk about some stuff. So you can contact me through the website if you wish um, after this uh, this short lecture. I'll just ask. This is something uh, of a personal request. Uh, I see some familiar faces today. I've chatted with some already. Um, but if you can uh, show your face, it's always nicer to speak to a face and uh, rather to speak to a to a name, to a faceless name. So if if you if it's possible, uh, that's a personal request uh, from me. Um, so yeah, let's let's begin. Um, I'm going to talk about theory today. So this is what I've been asked to do. And um, as you know, theory is not a um, sufficient condition for the formation of an analyst, but it's a necessary one uh, alongside um, having one's analysis and the supervision that orients uh, one's work. And in this sense, when we speak about knowledge uh, that is considered to be psychoanalytic, uh, we can say that it has several dimensions. Uh, first is the knowledge of the unconscious, then there is the knowledge of the transference and the direction of the treatment. And finally, there is theoretical knowledge that supports the work with the unconscious in the transference. And today I was asked to discuss this kind of psychoanalytic knowledge. And in light of the uh, argument presented by Alexandre Stevens uh, for the next NLS conference, I will present some insights uh, on the notions of fixation and repetition uh, in the context of uh, my work on the subject uh, of autism. And what better point to depart or to begin uh, this talk 
begin speaking about fixation and repetition uh, rather than uh, speaking of the Freudian drive. So if you can please indulge me, I will um, take you from uh, what we can refer to as a mistake in translation um, to a translation which is also a new take on the differential practice of the rim in the treatment of autism. And this will also be the point where uh, Maria will take over and uh, discuss the practicalities. So beginning with a error of translation, um, you know, the drive is a much more psychoanalytic concept than the instinct. Uh, however, in the uh, English translation by James Strachey, uh, the German word for drive, uh, Trieb in Freud, is translated to instinct. Now in German, these two words are very distinct. There is the Trieb and the instinct. But when we read the, the uh, original translation, we see that they're both translated to the same word. Now, Lacan in seminar 11, and I will focus on the seminar in the beginning of my talk today, explicitly says, Trieb and instinct have nothing in common. So I'll start by explaining that a little bit. So we'll take uh, small steps until we reach uh, some destination at least. So what is an instinct? An instinct can be viewed as a hardwired biological program that compels um, the survival of the organism. Um, it acts to fulfill the organism's instinctual needs by raising tension levels and lowering them when they are satisfied. Uh, this is what we can call the natural rhythm of the body. And I'll show you later a little schema. It looks a little bit like a sinus wave. Now, the drive is something completely different. The drive is a unique product of um, the encounter between the biological organism and language. It embodies the mutual effects that language and the body have on each other. And rather than being equated to the instinct, it originates from a rupture in the instinctual organization of the natural world of the organism. So we're talking here about a break that thrusts, uh, let's say, uh, something, uh, let's call it the organism, uh, from the real into the domain of symbolic reality uh, and introduces the order of the signifier. And now we're becoming a bit more Lacanian when we say that the drive emerges as an excess that is produced by the cut that the signifier introduces into the real. Hmm. Maybe a, an aphorism, but uh, can be uh, studied a bit further. I'm just going to leave it uh, there today. If we go back to Freud, we might say that this cut that Lacan goes to great extent to uh, describe in linguistic terms, um, this cut can be said to circumvent the orifices of the body, or what we call in psychoanalysis, the erogenous organs. So for Freud, we have the oral, the anal, the phallic, and for Lacan, we have also the scopic, having to do with the eyes and the gaze, and the invocatory, having to do with listening and the voice. So these are the names of the drives in psychoanalysis, where Lacan, at a certain point after seminar 10, takes the phallic off the list. Now, in seminar 11, Lacan presents another step in his assessment of the drive in what he calls the deconstruction of the drive. And he does so by using four Freudian components of the drive. So uh, the first one is the drang, the thrust. Second one is the ziel, the aim. The third is the object or the object. 
And the last is the Quelle or source. So I'll quickly um, elaborate uh, these components and contrast them with what we might call uh, the instinct. So the thrust of the drive is characterized by Freud as a constant force. And unlike the, uh, let's say, instinctual need, uh, like hunger, it doesn't engage the organism as a whole, but is divided into the erogenous zones of the body. Now, instead of a sinus wave, when we think about the thrust of the drive, we can imagine a straight line, uh, what in mathematics is called a constant function. The aim of the drive is what provides the trajectory for its satisfaction. But what is interesting is that Lacan insists that there is a strict dissociation between the aim of the drive and the object of the drive. What he says is that the drive aims for the satisfaction that is totally indifferent to the identity of its object. So when we think about the instinct and we think about hunger, for instance, we say, well, the object of hunger is the consumption of food. But when we speak about the oral drive, its satisfaction doesn't necessarily uh, is not, not its satisfaction not necessarily achieved by putting food in the mouth. For instance, one can gain oral satisfaction by just ordering from the menu. So we see that the drive aim goes around the object and not in the direction of the object. It gains satisfaction by demarcating the contours of the object. And this is why we argue that the drive reaches its goal without attaining its object. Now, the last uh, element that I'll discuss today is the source of the drive. And this is what Lacan associates with a rim-like structure of the erogenous zones of the body. So this is the word rim, which will be central in this talk. And here we see its first appearance. So the er erogenous zones are not strictly associated with their biological function, but uh, they're defined by their role in the mediation between the body and language. Now, armed with these four components of the drive, in seminar 11, Lacan develops what we call the schema of the drive circuit. And I'll share, um, I'll share this uh, schema with you uh, right now, just uh, to show you uh, how it looks like. So, this is um, my uh, sort of drawing of the schema, uh, copying it from the uh, seminar 11. And you see all the elements of the drive in the schema. So in the center of the schema, you identify the drive object. Right? On the right, there is the source of the drive that is replaced by the figure of the rim. The thrust of the drive is represented by the arrow that moves in a circular trajectory. It originates from within the rim, aims around the object, finally returning to its source, which is represented in the schema by the goal. So the schema accentuates the dissociation between the drive's aim and its object. And this time it demonstrates that the drive's goal is not the attainment of the object, but the return to the source. So I'll uh, stop sharing right now. Uh, what we see in Freud in different words is that at some point in a child's early life, the drive stops its development and is fixated in a certain way. And this fixation sets in place this circular and continuous movement of the drive circuit, putting in place this most essential mode of libidinal repetition. Uh, this is a repetition of a movement 
where the drive originates from the erogenous zone and continues to circumvent the object by returning to the erogenous zone from where it sets on its path yet again. So I'll share another um, little uh, drawing I made for you today, um, which uh, demonstrates why, while one is hungry, uh, one eats a sandwich and then uh, subdues his instinctual needs. So we look at this sinus wave, right? So someone is hungry, let's say, so they eat and they're not as hungry. Okay, and now they're hungry again and they eat or they're not hungry. This is how, let's say, the rhythm of the body, the rhythm of the organism, the rhythm of the instinct uh, works. Um, you, you get, you are hungry, you get full. But when we talk about the drive, it, we're talking about a different situation. It's a situation when one is hungry, okay, they eat food and they're not hungry anymore, but then they keep on eating another cake and another cake and maybe having an ice cream. And you see, this is the little uh, trajectory going out of the of the rhythm uh, of the body. So we see that the satisfaction that I gain from eating all these cakes has nothing to do with the instinctual rhythm, but has to do with the satisfaction of the drive. And this is why Lacan says, and I brought this little quote here, uh, that yeah. the object petit a, the object of the drive, is introduced from the fact that no food will ever satisfy the oral drive except by circumventing the eternally lacking object. So, um, not so much being an object that can be found and consumed, the drive object functions as the hinge that conditions the relationship between the rim in its manifestation as a source and a goal. So it's situated in the schema between two surfaces of the rim, that of the body and that of language. It's like a rock that is tucked under two sheets under which, around which a rope is tied to hold them together. It, it is demarcated by the rim and ensures that the two remain linked. So this is just some memories from my Bo Boy Scout years of how you tie together two uh two fabrics right you put a little rock inside and you tie them around with a rope right so we see this in uh, lacan schema as well now we take a step uh, into the domain of autism and i'll just share uh, briefly that one of uh, my hypotheses uh, regarding autism is that in autism something of the inscription of the drive of sorry of the rim in the psyche is foreclosed and in my book i call this autistic foreclosure and i associate it with the alterations that we see in the functioning of the drive among autistic uh, subjects um, i'll share another little drawing um, i've i've prepared for for today so uh, what uh, we can briefly state, and this drawing will illustrate uh, in, a, in, a way, in a, a way of illustration, is that in autism, the drive circuit is altered in such a way that neither affects the thrust of the drive, the thrust remains a constant force. It doesn't affect the object per se. The object appears in the foreground of an intolerable real. But what it affects is the rim. The rim is lacking. The source and the goal of the erogenous zone. Now, without a rim, the drive circuit loses its aim and is thrust into an aimless movement, as you can see here, unable to symbolically inscribe uh, the drive object. So in other words, we can say that without the rim, the drive circuit is short circuited. It lacks a source and is unable to return to its goal. And in this sense, it hinders the inscription of the drive object in the big other. Hmm? Uh, so this is one of the reasons that 
uh, and this is very, very much uh, a, a, an accepted sort of uh, idea in the Lacanian world of autism. Uh, this is the saying that in autism, there is no big other. So what we see in a or way that I will present it today is that the big other is not rendered as the carrier of the drive object. For autistic subjects, the other is in a way real without holes, utterly divorced from the domain of the symbolic. And without a rim, the object is unable to initiate the relationship between the subject and the other, or the subject and language. And then we are faced with subjects that are, have very unique difficulties in their entry into language. So what is there to do uh, you know, when there is no big other? Uh, this is a big question. And another question that uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, an outcome of this one. Uh, are, are we talking about subjects that are truly outside of language? This is something that some people might uh, think. And in my book, I insist that this is not the case. I insist that autistic subjects are not divorced from language but they use language in original ways in order to find their own unique solutions for being in the world. What I basically argue, and I won't get too deeply into this today, is that while autistic subjects have no access to the big other in terms of the locus of signifiers, they do have access to language with the help of the sign. And uh, the sign, if we refer to uh, uh, some uh, linguistic theories in the field of semiotics and also in Lacan's psychoanalysis, the sign is a linguistic unit that is distinct from the signifier. It has distinct characteristics. Uh, I can just briefly say that it's more similar to uh, what we can refer to as a rigid linguistic object rather than the empty and dynamic signify. Hmm? Uh, today I decided not to talk uh, too much uh, linguistics, so if you're interested we can talk about it at another time. Now what I will talk about today is the fact that with the help of signs, autistic subjects are able to construct what we call, uh, what uh, Jean-Claude Maleval and Eric Laurent call the neo-rim. So this is not the original rim of the drive circuit, right? I've mentioned that in autism, the hypothesis is that the rim, the rim of the drive circuit, is not inscribed or inscribed and, and is foreclosed. So the neo rim, the rim of autism, is a supplementary rim that enables a unique psychic dynamism in autism. And it is through the work of repetition and memorization that autistic subjects are able to develop their neo rim based on their linguistic functionality up to the level of total independence. And in my work, I've attempted to identify the different modalities in the utilization of the sign in the construction of the rim. And based on previous work of Jean-Claude Maleval, and other case studies and testimonies that I've had access to. I've identified so far four such modalities that are distributed on what I call the autistic linguistic spectrum, which is a more of a, you know, like a, a, a play of words uh, referring to the ASD, the, the autism spectrum disorder, and is in fact an alternative to the behavioral cognitivist framework of the ASD. Now, each of these modalities enables a particular dynamism for the subject in its engagement with the body, with knowledge, and with the social bond. And each of these modalities dictates a different mode of operation for the subject. And in this sense, we can say that they necessitate a distinct analytic position in the treatment and facilitation of autism. So they provide some trajectories in this sense. 
Now, in the rest of my time today, I think I have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I'll briefly describe these modalities. And finally, I'll present them on my last uh, little drawing for you today on uh, the autistic linguistic spectrum, which is a model that hopefully in the future uh, would be better translated into a mathem of some sorts. So let's start from the first modality, uh, which we can call the absence of the rim. So the first modality of the rim, uh, of the neo rim, uh, I'll call it the rim from now on, but I'm referring to the autistic neo rim. So the first modality of the rim characterizes the most severe forms of autism. And this is where uh, autistic subjects refuse to engage with language as a whole. Uh, in these cases, we see almost no linguistic expressions. Uh, we do see some spontaneous outbreaks of sounds, some holophrastic vocalizations. We see subjects that mm, manifest a state of bodily confusion where there's no degree of separation between subject and object. In a way, I, I'll mention this as sort of a side note. I think this is somewhat of a hypothetical uh, mode because I think that all subjects sort of take a step further, but this is a, a, a modality that we hypothesize. Now in this state, uh, what we see is that internal and external stimuli are experienced both as repeating invasions and the world is experienced as an all engulfing limitless void. It is a repetition that is totally out of the subject's control. And the subject that is inhabited by this archaic and primitive body experiences terrible anxiety. And what we see is that in order to surmount this anxiety, these subjects commit acts of extreme violence, self-aggressiveness and self-mutilation. We can say with the aim of demarcating a rim to their bodies that could give them some degree of separation. So this is what we can call the hypothetical modality of the absence of the rim. Now, the second modality of the rim is characterized by reliance on what is called autistic objects. Now, this term is drawn from the work of Franz Tustin. She's a British psychoanalyst that worked with autistic children. And she described how they constantly stick objects to their bodies, not using them for their objective functions, but for their sensations. And she argued that they conceive of these objects as part of their bodies and through them gain some self-sufficiency that protects them from the anxiety that uh, they experience in the world. Now, one might say that this fascination and total absorption in the interaction with autistic objects, and we see this in the clinic of autism, this uh, absorption provides a sufficient distraction that protects the subject from, a, let's say, the disorganized experience of the body and provides it with some sense of stability and control. So we're talking about moments where autistic subjects lose themselves in their objects, becoming isolated in these temporary states of shielded interaction. Uh, these are commonly repetitive or ritualized patterns of verbal or uh, sensomotor behavior. And these have little space available for other people. It's, they are very uh, intimate and private. Now, in a paper that was recently published, I call these moments of transitive equation, uh, differentiating this from transitive identification. So there's, uh, these are moments of a certain equation that the subject experiences uh, with the autistic object, uh, becoming the autistic object in a way. Now, these moments are helpful. They're very helpful for autistic subjects, uh, but their duration is limited. Uh, because the subject remains dependent on meticulously maintaining this rigid relationship that they achieve uh, with the object. 
Now, this tendency has already been described by Leo Kanner, who was, uh, let's say, the uh, first psychologist to uh, refer to autism as a distinct syndrome. And he said that he identified already in 1943 an anxiously obsessive desire for the maintenance of sameness, he calls this sameness, that nobody but the child himself may disrupt on rare occasions. So what we see is we see, um, let's say, these accidental encounters with objects that have dynamic value for the subject and can be somehow maintained through their repetition. But when the repetition is broken, and usually is broken by the outside, yeah, their dynamic value is lost. So this renders the reliance on transitive equation with the object to be fragile and prone to collapse. And this is when we sometimes see fits of rage and anxiety. Going on uh, to the third modality of the rim, uh, which is called the dynamic rim. So I forgot to mention the second modality is called the protective rim. This is how the rim is used for protection. And the third modality is the dynamic rim. Now, after collecting all these different objects, on the protective rim, uh, their use can facilitate the development of the, the dynamic rim. So briefly, I can state that this entails the transition from the level of the simple autistic object to the level of the complex autistic object. Now, the complex autistic object is a more developed and versatile modality of the autistic object. Basically, we can see it as a construct that combines the localized dynamic function of several autistic objects into a complex apparatus. And this enables the subject to handle more intricate goals in more complex circumstances. Uh, it provides um, a, a certain consistency, a supplementary consistency to the body image and really contributes to the subject's libidinal animation. And we say, we call it dynamic, uh, and this is uh, borrowed from uh, Maleval, we call it dynamic because it's open to change. Its characteristics can develop over time and its function can be adapted to different contexts and different situations. And the subject can choose to plug into it at will like an auxiliary machine and integrate its dynamic properties. But it's important to mention that the dynamic rim does not entail a direct sense of corporeal possession. This is because it is it, it provides an integration that is based on one's intellectual comprehension of the parallel between the object and the body. And it doesn't entail a vital sense of intimacy or belonging. So we can say that it is based on an intellectual process of trial and error where the subject learns how to manage certain bodily sensations and engage in certain movements uh, with the help of the complex autistic object, later on developing these to more uh, proficient skills um, that can turn into um, skills that are, let's say, appreciated in the social bond. Now, what we must emphasize is the, that the memorization and the contextualization of these situations enables the preservation of an acquired knowledge of being through a repetition that is more like a learning by heart than what we saw in the protective rim, which is the maintenance of an immediate dynamic, keeping it going, never letting it go. So I'm nearing the end of of, uh, of my talk and getting to the last modality of the rim, which is called the hollowed out rim. Now, the reliance on the integrating function of the intellect is sometimes developed among autistic subjects to a level in which the neo rim is hollowed out from its objects, leaving the subject to solely rely on its intellectual and linguistic capacities. So one can say that on all the modalities of the autistic neo rim, 
inscriptions happen in the psyche. But these are not taken in the other, in the big other, but are said to be taken in the supplementary locus that Maleval calls quite ingeniously, I think, the synthetic other. Now, on the level of the hollowed out rim, the development of specific interests that give rise to a, a, the joyful construction of databases and knowledge of and experience happens in this synthetic other. And these can be developed in solitary activities, what can be viewed as closed off system of knowledge. And I recommend seeing a clip on YouTube by Amanda Bags called In Our Language that discusses this. Or they can be developed into fields of expertise uh, that are socially valued, up to the point where one is fully incorporated in the social bond and has even, uh, we can say, uh, total independence. Now, on this level, work with autistic subjects revolves the development of their linguistic skills through the support of their curiosity for knowledge and engagement with language. So we see here a repetition as an extension of knowledge in an infinite chain. Right? Um, now, there is another aspect to this that I've described um, in the book and also in, in another paper. Um, the way that uh, the reliance of, on knowledge also is accompanied by a certain uh, creation, uh, let's say a, a, a libidinal creation that is invested in the social bond. But I don't think I'll have time to talk about this today. I'll just mention that uh, so far I've identified two trajectories in this way. One is an imaginary staging of a loss. And the other is a fabrication of a unique autistic narcissistic object that is invested in a domain beyond the subject's control. In any case, these two um, acts, let's say, um, are described by autistic subjects as uh, extremely important and mark a dramatic change in, in their subjective dynamism and in their life in general. So I'll show you the last um, drawing that I uh, made today and I'll finish up uh, my talk. So what you see here uh, is a summary of the development of the modalities of the neo-rim in the treatment of autism. Now, I want to emphasize that this should not be taken as a developmental model. Right? It is a schema that marks out several interdependent waypoints in the development of one's linguistic functionality and its use in the world. Um, so any, like any form of metapsychology, it doesn't aim to determine the confines of the subject, right? But it aims to provide some coordinates in the direction of the treatment, right? Um, I, I hope at least that uh, they can be developed and refined by you, the listeners today that are interested in the psycho in Lacanian psychoanalytic approach uh, to autism. And well, it will be my pleasure to discuss them in a short while. Um, but I'll stop here, um, as I'm really uh, looking forward to Maria's presentation on the uh, elements of the treatment uh, of autism from her practice. So uh, we can stop here. And um, I thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Maria. Wonderful. Wow, what a combination. <laughs> Amazing both papers or present or work. Yeah. So, well, now we open. Leon, do you want to say something before we open to participants? No, please. Okay, Let's, because. Uh, ah, okay, yeah. that was, I'm sorry, that was a clapping. I, I thought oh, it was yes. a hand. <laughs> okay. So thank we you. open to the floor. I know that Marina, thank you so much, Marina, because she she has helped us a lot in this uh, to, for yes. today's activity. So if you want yes. to uh, start asking some question or then Mar Maria, if you have uh, a little bit uh, also, I know that you have or Andrea, you know, like we'll see and we open the, the floor. So Marina, you want to start? Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Leon. Uh, the presentation was amazing, uh, both Maria's and Leon's. 
And I would like to start with a question to Liam Brainer. As mentioned in your book, autistic subjects have difficulty in entering the social bond. They use language of the other linguistic units, which are called signs, and they construct the synthetic other. You also mentioned that the autistic unconscious is represented topologically, like the torus, in contrast to the, the medius strip which represents the Freudian uh, unconscious. Could you give us some details on the two topological dimensions and their difference? Okay, yeah, thanks, Marina, for this uh, question. Uh, I've spoken to Marina before, and she did such an amazing job reading uh, the chapter I, I provided. I'm really looking forward for further questions. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, this is a, uh, a topic that um, is very interesting to me today and also um, I think needs uh, further development. Um, but when we think about the unconscious, um, let's think about it in two ways, um, in a Freudian and Lacanian way. So, um, in uh, the Freudian uh, rendition, the unconscious is um, constructed uh, through repression. So. Repression is a vital element in uh, the construction of the unconscious. And what we see in autism, um, and this is something that uh, we see in the uh, psychoanalytic literature, but also um, in the testimonies of autistic subjects, is that in autism we don't really see repression. Um, what I try to sort of um, emphasize is that well, we definitely don't see secondary repression or what Freud called uh, depression as defense. This is the very neurotic kind of mechanism. But we also don't see primal repression on the level that Freud called the Yahoo. In English, we call this affirmation. So according to the Freudian definition, we cannot say that the autistic unconscious, well, it just doesn't abide by this definition. So in this sense, we have to provide a new definition for the unconscious when we talk about autism. Now, in Lacanian terms, uh, Lacan says that the unconscious is structured like a language made up of signifiers. Now, OK, this is the definition of the unconscious. But in autism, we see that there is no other. Uh, there is no access to signifiers. Hmm? So in this sense, we also have a problem of speaking of uh, the unconscious in terms of autism, even if we address it from a Lacanian perspective. So in both of the, from both of these perspectives, we have to say something new about the unconscious uh, when we speak about it uh, in terms of autism. Now, uh, uh, Marina, you've mentioned the, the uh, Mobius strip and the torus. Um, it's true that uh, Lacan uses the Mobius strip um, as a demonstration of uh, the relationship between consciousness and the unconscious in neurosis. Uh, the Mobius strip is um, like a little uh, strip, and you can make it at home if you just take uh, a paper strip and make one twist. Uh, you see this image in the uh, uh, painting. You see of this image in the uh, I just, I just uh, Maria. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think we'll just uh, mute when when uh, we both speak because might cause some problems. Okay, so you see the Mobius strip in the uh, pictures drawn by Usher, where you see this ant walking on the strip. Uh, it's it's a special kind of topological figure because on every point of the Mobius, it seems like there are two surfaces. But mathematically speaking, topologically speaking, the Mobius strip is made of only one surface. If you go over the surface, you see that you will get back to the same point you started with. So this is a nice demonstration of how the unconscious works uh, in neurosis. Now, in autism, uh, I provide the uh, example of the torus. And uh, Eric Laurent presents this example uh, earlier in his book, um, uh, La Batale del Autisme. And um, the torus is an interesting topological figure because it has a surface which 
has no distinction between inside and an outside. So in a way, if uh, one is situated on the surface of the torus, you can imagine it like a donut with a hole in the middle. So it's like a, a donut, yes. Uh, so if you are situated on the surface of the torus and you look inside, you are actually looking outside as well. You're seeing yourself looking inside on the outside. So we see here a continuity, a lack of distinction between inside and outside. Um, when Lacan talks about uh, the unconscious in psychosis, uh, there is one uh, special quote uh, where he calls it, uh, well, the, the psychotic unconscious is like an open sky. You won't find this in the English translation. Uh, it's a bit different uh, translated by Bruce Fink, but in the French it's A ciel ouvert, uh, which is like the name of the famous movie uh, from Les Courtilles in uh, Belgium. Uh, mm -hmm. So, like an open sky, the unconscious, uh, like an, an, an open sky. And I think this is a clue as to how the uh, autistic unconscious operates. Um, and I, I found a very compelling uh, testimony to this kind of functioning in Temple Grandin's book, Thinking in Pictures. And it's a terrific book uh, if you want to see a, a very interesting testimony of of an autistic subject. And she says that, in fact, well, she says this, she has no repression. So there is no repression in her psyche. It's interesting because she's not a psychoanalyst. Um, but she says that she has access to all of her memories. And she can actively manipulate her memory, which is composed of a set of images. And through this manipulation, she is able uh, to construct um, I don't know, elements in her psyche which help her out and, um, and enable her to, to achieve the things that she's achieved in life. So if you ask me, and this again, this is something that needs further development. Um, if we think of the autistic uh, unconscious as an open sky, uh, we can think about it as something that can be uh, manipulated in the treatment consciously. So this is something, so in this sense, the work with the unconscious, and this is the work of the psychoanalyst, um, in a way, if, if uh, this is uh, my, uh, let's say, intuition or hypothesis at this point, is to be achieved uh, in a very direct and open way. Hmm? Uh, so the subject can uh, manipulate it in this way. Uh, Grandin gave us a clue as to th this manipulation should happen on a level, an, an imaginary level. Uh, but I think that uh, we should be open to uh, more ways uh, in which this can happen uh, by uh, speaking with other subjects. So I hope this was a clarifying uh, answer, Marina. Thank you very much, Leo. Uh, actually, I didn't say so, you said so in your book. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Leon. So now, Maria, Riz, if you can ask your question. Thank you. Um, first of all, well, I, again, wanted to thank uh, Maria and Leon for uh, the talk. It's been really, really helpful and, and really good content. Um, so basically, my question is sort of to Maria and it's more in a practical sense. Uh, I'm just curious if you wanted to share a little bit of how do you navigate sort of your conversations with, because um, I, I know you, you engage with like sort of uh, frontline staff who are the people who sort of like work with your clients on a daily basis. And like, I'm curious about how you navigate those conversations in terms of like, I know that sometimes it can be challenging to share or explain sort of what you're like, what you're basing your approach uh, in, in terms of like psychoanalytic or Lacanian theory. So I'm not even sure if you take too much time or energy in explaining this, but um, yeah, I don't know if, if that makes sense. I'm just sort of curious because it's usually in those environments it's a lot of cbt and those kind of um theories uh so i'm always 
feel a little challenging to um, find a way to introduce uh, Lacanian theory and um, I'm interested in like sort of tips and tricks on how you do it. Um, and I also wanted to, this is sort of like a second, um, I wanted to also subscribe to sort of your question to Leon uh, on if there's a continuity on those three modalities of the rim if, or if, yeah, if there's a logical sort of like step one, two, three, or if there's sort of like a reversal sometimes and yeah, that's, that's sort of my question. Thanks. Wow. Thank you for that question. The first question, which is something that I really, really love to talk about. I navigate the, that world of, I navigate that thought. I mean, I'm in the community. I'm out there. For years, I have navigated that world of even colleagues who, you know, they're CBT practitioners. Um, and the way you do this is with, you know, you do your work and when they see effects, when they see changes, they're going to ask. And then you share, you share your work with them. Okay. And I'll give you a good example. When I worked on my postdoc, it was, it was a setting where it was all about evidence-based practices. And I had to do a colloquium. I did mine on non-directive, uh, non-directive therapy, uh, psychodynamic non-directive play work with autistic children. And they said, well, if you want to do this, but you're, you're going to have to show that some evidence-based kind of things. And I worked very, very hard. And I, and by the way, there's certain things that out there, I'm not going to get into it now, but there's research that shows and that you can, you can work with, okay. That, uh, psychodynamic practices with autistic uh, children, um, uh, work. Okay. But that being said, when I presented this, this work, it was very nicely received. And I went on in that same setting, uh, we went on to, I went on to work in an outpatient setting, seeing autistic uh, uh, individuals with a dual diagnosis. And uh, they were all very, very interested in the work that I was doing. So, and I continue to do this, you know, again, I'm not just in private practice, I'm in different community settings where Many practitioners come from, from CBT. So uh, I don't know if that answers the question, um, but you just need to do your work. And, and as they see again, as they see changes, I, as they see effects, people will become interested and they will ask and you're just there ready to, to talk about the work that you do. Now about the, the, over, the, um, the continuum of the, of the rim. And I have that question now for Leon. As I saw when I when I look back at my cases and I was trying to situate, you know, what is happening here in the rim. Um, Leon, thank yeah, you, maybe Maria. I'll, I'll briefly comment, Maria, because it's a very good question. Um, it's a very practical and important question. The idea that that at least I progress is a non a non developmental model. So. This is generally right. what I present. And, you know, each modality, and I'm not saying that these are the only modalities uh, that exist uh, for autistic subjects. It's, it's um, the job of all of us to, to find out. Maybe there are more, right? But these are the modalities that I identified. And these modalities, each one dictates a different mode of operation in the treatment, right? So these are modalities that are oriented to the practice. Uh, they can all appear in our practice, or only some of them can appear in our practice. I can tell you, and this is, might be like a, a, a heuristic, that usually protection is to be put in place before the dynamic and intellectual properties of the rim are developed. But you know, sometimes subjects don't need the protection at an early age. Sometimes autistic subjects didn't experience uh, that at an early age, and they only come to the to our practice at an older age. 
when they're struggling with uh, social problems or sexual problems. And then, well, there is no need to address the uh, protective aspect of the rim, but the complexification of the synthetic other is uh, what is to be put in place, right? And uh, I can attest from at least my praxis, which is mostly uh, with uh, autistic subjects, which are um, on, on that, the sort of engaging with that, these questions, that, you know, the, the, the work is, is, let's say, a, a work of uh, identifying the, the models uh, that uh, they compose uh, for understanding and living in the world and complexifying them. This can happen. But I don't think that there is sort of a reliance and we have to see one, two, three, and then four. But I do think that protection is sort of substantial. Um, but again, well, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that we can find cases where um, it works otherwise. So again, I hope this answered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. That, but I truly find this model very, very helpful in placing um, where what is happening. And like you said, it's not a developmental model; it's not linear. Uh, however, it's it's ex extreme. It's very. It did help me to con to go back and conceptualize these cases, and I think it's very helpful for uh, uh, practitioners who are also, you know, starting out. They you, they can really. They can really start to conceptualize with this model. I think it's very it's very helpful. Now, I agree with you. Uh, my last case, uh, the Asperger, uh, you know, who has Asperger and he's gifted. Uh, there is no he's not you know he is in that in that pinnacle, moving towards that pinnacle of the dynamic rim, and it's clear there. It's clear. I'm talking more about my second case where he's low functioning, he's nonverbal, where you can see the two. You, I could really see that at the beginning he was, he was there in this in this void in this. But at the same time he's in the protective, working on that. I'm speaking of those cases where you can see like transitioning. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, both Maria and Leon. <laughs> yeah, Peter, you have the. I think you were first, and Andrea. So. <laughs> And then after Andrea. Sure, can you hear me? Hi, Leon. Hi, Maria. It's, uh, this is a, a, a rare pleasure for me, this lecture, in that the, the great majority of it I agree with, and that I'm going to uh, state that uh, I believe, uh, though Leon, your book is still in the, the mail, that the uh, a lot of a lot of uh, parallels uh, to, to what I do, where it's a, it's a practice with artists, where I, I want to say it's essentially more of a clinic of doing and making in line with the symptom and not thinking or uh, repression. And I think it's very you know important that uh, you know uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis is caught up to because because. You know, I think an interesting te uh, tenet for me is that I think it's not uh, only uh, a as you eloquently describe uh, features of an autistic subject, Leon, but that I think there are also incident. I believe there are features of this in general in in contemporaneous society. But but so but 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 what I want to say is. Uh, since I do uh, agree with most of it, I did want to ask two little points, one, one for each of you, uh, uh, that I you know, hope for a you know, a elaboration or, or, or further research. Because this idea of, of, the, of the synthetic uh, other is, is I, I think, very crucial. But so, for example, Maria, with your case, of what you know at one point you point out that your patient was no longer creating the the objects that keep the other at a distance and it's therapeutic it, uh, 
entered them into the social bond a little more. That's uh, what it seems. And yet, this is a, an artist, a person uh, creating. Uh, what I want to point out is that it's you know it's not so clear to me that it's a it, it's a great thing to uh, stop him from creating these objects. Right. Can I, can I, okay. For, yeah, I just need to clarify something, okay? V, I'm so sorry, I know it's three cases and they're back to back, I can get confusing, okay? But the, he is not an artist. That was the second case. The one he stopped creating his objects, he's not an artist. This is the nonverbal, okay? The artist is the third case. So I think there's a little confusion there. This is why it sounds a little weird, okay? I see. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. This is the second case. This is the case of um, of the nonverbal adult who, when I started, he's very low. He was he's low functioning, but then again, he's he's done a lot of progress. And yes, at the beginning, uh, he is creating objects, create objects of his creation. Okay, creating creating these objects to keep the other at a distance and to keep himself safe and to and to reduce his anxiety okay now with the treatment as the treatment progresses i can tell you i am the first one to be surprised i think one fantastic thing about this clinic is that at least i'm always surprised i'm always surprised that you know what i find next time and he abandoned the objects he's no longer creating these objects he's no longer um using the blanket anymore and all of this has pretty much happened back to back, really. And uh, he's there sitting, watching television without the blanket, okay? And now he has incorporated me into the circular dance that he continues to do. He used to do that with a particular object that he has also abandoned. So he has abandoned many of these objects and he hasn't, and then I realized at some point, wait a minute, I'm the object now. But then reading this chapter, Leon's chapter, I'm like, no, I'm the double layer. And this is, like I said, this is when it's it's beautiful when you see theory and uh, the clinic coming together and you can really see it, okay? But that is the, the second case, which I'm sorry because I, I've read these cases back to back. But the artist, the artist, um, no, the artist did not have, the, was making, the artist is not, in the, the artist is a gifted uh, uh, Asperger. Okay, who is an amazing, amazing artist, and uh, who will be, who will do very, very well in life with his uh, with his art. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no. I mean, it was my it was my mistake. Uh, though, though, no. Still, uh, it's just three not... cases back to back. It gets confusing. And and my question, uh, serious, what what you. Think? What you think about this, Leon, concerns at the beginning uh, about the the distinction of the Lacanian distinction of the drive, which I have spent most of my life being in in, in agreement with. That is to say, surely it's not a, you know a sort of almost biological determinism of this sort of instinct-based classical psychoanalyst model that you know Lacan was rightfully critiquing. And that I think it's very, very important, both theoretically and, and yeah, of course, uh, clinically, but to, 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 to recognize the, the, the divi division, to use your words, you know, predicated on rupture between instinct and drive. And yet I have to say, even though uh, as a working hy hypothesis, uh, and to to uh, detract from the, the the more classical model, which is absurd. But what I have to say is that it also seems, uh, you know, absurd and not very realistic uh, for Lacanians to strictly divide drive and instinct. And I mean, uh, quite frankly. Uh, thinking about autistic individuals where biological impulses 
become quite relevant or, or, or more so, you know, it seems very unrealistic to, to me to, to consider, you know, the drives completely free from instinctual residue. Very important on a theoretical level that that, that jump, you know, was made to distinguish them. You know, uh, uh, in all the complexities, you know, as you put it, uh, on account, you said something like on account of signifiers effect on the real, and there's various ways we can formulate uh, this where uh, drive and instinct uh, divide and how they do. But nonetheless, it seems wholly unrealistic to me. That is, and I think contributes to a sort of denial of any biological predication in Lacanianism and, for that matter, kind of uh, postmodern narratives. And I was wondering your thoughts about that, because it seems to me wholly unrealistic on a psychological level. Your basis. Thanks, Peter, for this uh, question. Maybe you can clarify your question. Um... Well, I mean, we, I mean, kind of like, we, we, you know, when, when you were talking about hung, hunger, right? We are biological beings. And even though it's very important for the Lacanian clinic to understand that the drive is not instinct, nonetheless, it seems absurd to me to say that drives are completely alien and disconnected from uh, the in, it, what we could call, you know, the instinctual life of the body and, and, and biology. It seems very unrealistic. I think it's important that the drive is recognized to sort of, you know, circumvent and so for that matter, circumnavigate and be distinct from the instincts as were construed by these classical Freudians. And yet it seems very unrealistic on a, you know, I mean, for example, on an academic psych psycholog psych psychological or just medical basis. Well, maybe I can answer this uh, briefly. Um, you know, the, the drive is, um, the drive, first of all, is represented in the psyche. This is what Freud uh, says. Well, the drive is, let's say, the first instance of psychic representation. He calls this uh, representatives of the drive, right? This is what he, he describes. And he says that these representatives are somewhere in between the level of in instinct and the level of a fully articulated idea, right? So they're not, uh, they're not a signifier in Lacanian terms, and they're not hunger in, let's say, instinctual terms. There's something in the middle, right? There's something in between, and they in, in, this, this is Freud. And uh, in the moment that they're inscribed in the psyche, something about the up operation of the psyche is also fixated. So, you know, this is quite commonsensical from Freud. He says, in order for, many things happen, you know, and you look at babies, many things happen for babies. But in order for something to persist, to, to, to be more than an immediate experience, uh, we have to inscribe it. It has to be inscribed, right? Otherwise, it's just like a camera, you know, viewing things. And, and, and every moment something is viewed, but there is no continuation. There is no, nothing that we can call a psyche at that point. So the drives, the inscription of the drives, uh, enables, um, let's say, what we call a psyche in psychoanalysis, right? Um, this is why it's important for Lacan to distinguish them from the instinct, that for him, the instinct would be something that doesn't necessarily have to be, doesn't, is not inscribed. It, it operates on the level of, let's say, what I gave the example of the camera, right? So these, these are things which happen and go away. They are important for the operation of the camera, let's say, but they, they, they are not really have anything to do with, with what we call a psyche. And this is why I think, and this is only my humble opinion, that that Lacan distinguishes between these two, uh, these two notions. Uh, I think it's not a redundant distinction because uh, one has to do with what Lacan's view as, as a psyche, and the other has to do with, let's say, the, the organismic apparatus, which is definitely part of, of our life, yeah. it's, it's, uh, but it is only part of our life or part of our reality when it is inscribed. Yeah. Thank you, Peter and Leon. Now, Andrea, you have the, please, your, your question. 
Thank you, Leon and uh, Maria. My question is for Maria. Uh, I was wondering if you can talk more about the case of a broken heart and if you can talk more um, about sand design and how you used it in the, in the therapy. I'm sorry, what was the last? Uh... How you used it in her treatment. How did I use, I'm sorry. Her sign. The sign? Yeah, what was Sandy's sign and how you used it in the treatment with her? Okay. <clears throat> now, I, I believe that the, the most important aspect of the case, like I, I, I said, uh, is, is the songs and it's, it's the voice. Okay. And, um, and how she, so thinking of the sign here, okay, how the, what happened in this case where you can see the evolution, you know, her development there in that room is how she goes from being, from singing an entire song, a very, with very complex words and lengthy song, and even including the dial the radio station. She goes from singing this entire song, which again, it surprised me that she could do that because she really, she just spoke words here and there and, and all she had was sounds, okay? So she went from, from losing all these lyrics, all these words, verbosity. This is a case where you can really see the verbosity or the excess, not the deficit, you know? Because she can say words and she can say many, many words in the song. So she goes from losing the song, these lyrics, these lyrics, to singing a shorter, uh, a song with just two lines. And then she loses, she doesn't do that anymore. And then she starts to do the humming of the, the wedding march. And then eventually, I don't even recognize the melodies anymore. Now she's doing melodies of her humming to melodies of her own creation okay so how does this i mean this is what's important here because as she is losing all these lyrics okay and she she begins to hum these melodies she begins to say more words and she starts to use those short sentences like saying marie sleep marie sleep okay so the sign the question of the sign here you know, I would say that it comes via this, the, these losing of these, of all of these, of all this verbosity. And it, as you can see, it becomes uh, narrower, okay? Shortens in a way, all this. I don't know if that answers. Perhaps Leon can add something to this, how he sees that. No, I have nothing to add. Okay. Um, I don't know the answer. Uh, okay, somebody else have questions, comments? Marina? <laughs> And I've got a question um, for Maria. I would like to ask her about the, um, the third case, about the artist, actually, and if we could say that uh, this case is the hollowing out of the rim, according to Leon Brenner's um, book. Um, the first one is this, and the second one for Maria is um, how how difficult it is for an analyst to um, incorporate the objects of like you said if you may if you were like um, becoming the double. How difficult is it for a practitioner to do so. You had a first question for Liam, right? Or do, do I answer? 
I think it was Marina? for you, Maria. Yes. It's for me. It was two questions. Okay, no, no. this is for me. Okay. Yeah, for you, they are clinical questions, actually. Okay, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I, I understood that there was also for Leon now and then me. Okay. The first question was for the third case of yours. Okay. Now, how how difficult was it in the treatment to get to that place where I become his object double? Is that is that the question? The one is is that is that the question? The one is Marina. And how difficult it was, or how how is it difficult to get from the beginning until that moment where I can see that I have become an object double for Adrian? Right? Right. And the second one was if mm -hmm. you think that in the case of the artist, um is the hollowing out of the rib because he's open to the synthetic gather he's fabricating okay. something okay. the first the first question okay how can i put this it was it was you don't know what's going to happen in the treatment you know i never i was never there thinking how am i going to become an object double for Adrian. It, that, that never even crossed my mind. Okay. Uh, that's why I said it's really, really surprised me. Okay. At the mo in fact, it surprised me that he was abandoning all these objects, one after another, after another, after another, which is wonderful. Again, that you can see theory in practice. Okay. But I never enter a treatment with a, a plan of this is how things are going to happen. It's the, uh, it's the, uh, it's the subject, it's Adrian who leads, okay? And as he leads, and then I move forward. I would say what I do do that is, that is planned is when I observe and I observe, it's always coming from a place of how am I going to insert myself in this, in this presentation, which I would say, how am I gonna insert myself in this rim? Okay. Now that is more, this is where you, and I think it's important here to speak about the desire of the analyst, okay? Which is, is there, it's present. Because there's, it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to work. Um, it's very challenging at the beginning of the treatment, especially to find that opening, to be able to insert yourself it's very difficult, okay? So it, there's a lot of observation, there's lots. And by the way, sometimes you try and you feel that maybe it's here, you see an opening, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, okay? So I would say that first, you need to find any case, any case, whether it's low functioning or whether, you know, if we look at it on the development of the rim, uh, whether it's, you know, it's in the protective, moving into the dynamic, you need to find openings so that you can, you can work. Okay. Now it was never, I never, I never, I never, I never had a plan that where I said, you know, now that we've moved in this direction, right? Somehow I'm going to work on intervention so that I can become his double. It never, it, it just never, because you don't know how the treatment is going to go. It's the, it's a, it's the, it's the subject who leads you. In this, in this, of course, that there were, there were moments that paved the way for that to have happened. Okay, and now in retrospect, as I'm writing the case, I can see it clearly. Okay, there were, there were things that were occurring that led to Adrian taking me placing me in that in that position of that um, ready-made apparatus, this whole, this whole object, because this is what I would be, right? And I don't know if we can say a replacement for all those other objects that he, he got rid of. Of course, this is in that rim that you can see that there's movement. There is movement towards more, um, how can we say, um, uh, uh, 
I'm, I don't want to use better. I'm just saying there's there's a movement towards a better ways of of being in the world, okay, and functioning, okay, and being in the world with with himself and the other, okay. Uh, but we don't really know. We 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 are working in a way to for that to happen. Everything, all our movements, right, are are in that direction. But we don't even we don't really know if at some point. Um, the subject is going to construct a, a double. It happened here, and I can see it clearly. And you can see all everything else that was happening when he started to abandon all the objects, all these objects. And I was thinking here, this is really this is really interesting. He's not fabricating anything anymore. He's not using his his blanket anymore. And then that paved the way for him. To, to incorporate me, okay? But it's it's a step at a time. It's a step at a time, okay? And I want to say something else about the objects. I, I think it was Tustin. It was it was Francis Tustin who said that it's at some moment it is important for these objects to be abandoned for any movement to take place. Yeah, because the, they are there are uh, life life uh, life taking objects. If they can let go, if they can't uh, abandon the object, they become life. I don't know if that's exactly how she stated, but they become life taking objects, I think. And the last question about the artist, uh, well, you can see he's on his way and then that rim of, you know, of the pinnacle, he's on his way there, okay? Uh, creating, you know, all the social exchange, uh, being able to to use his interests and talents to create this this exchange, and he's very much moving forward. Uh, I would say he has moved forward. So in that direction. Okay, Leon, do you want to say something? Yeah, maybe I'm, I can add a little bit. Uh, I think we're almost at the end, but just to add to this, I think, Marina, a very important question. Um, I think, you know, when we, do, when we look at an, an analysis um, in cases of neurosis, um, you know, there's no active manipulation of the transference. It, it is not that someone takes uh, one, two, three steps in order to uh, sort of enable the transference. Um, you know, the only thing that we might do is not fall into the trap of the, the conception of love, right? As, as Lacan talks about in seminar eight, when he talks about Socrates, that doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, let uh, his student uh, put him in his, his pocket as his, as his uh, lover. What, the only thing that we have are hints of our positioning in the transference, right? And this is what directs the, the treatment, yes. Sometimes there is no transference and yeah, we don't even start. Yeah, this, this is possible. And on the level of, of autism, you know, maybe it's not exactly transference or we need to rearticulate what transference is, yes. Uh, but again, there is no active situating of the analyst in a certain position. And again, this is always a questioning. Am I functioning as the double, as Maria has very eloquently said, yes? Am I, am I positioned as the double? This is always a hypothesis. And again, this is, this is something that I think is very important in Lacanian orientation, that the analyst never knows. Right? It's, it's never a matter of knowing, of having a knowledge of the subject. Well, but there is a work, right? And these are works that are based on hypotheses. Maybe I am. And let's see where the treatment uh, takes us uh, from there. So I think it's uh, very crucial. In any form of an analysis, and we see this in autism as well. Thank you, Leon. So, I don't know if you both want like final words. I will close at already two o'clock. So, uh... well, it's already eight o'clock here. As you can <laughs> see, it became it became darker. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm, I had a terrific time, and thank you so much for having me. I really hope to come and visit uh, Canada soon. Yeah. I, visit, yeah, I visited really a few years ago. It was one of my best 
vacations in my whole life. Uh, but I went to the, the west of Canada. So maybe it's time to visit Toronto as well yeah, and say okay. hello. Uh, so in, in hope of doing that in the future. You would well, you. very welcome. Maria? I want to say, I just want to say thank you, Inez. Thank you, Leon. This has been, for me, it has been a wonderful experience, fantastic conversation, and hope that there's many more like yeah. this. Yeah. The, um, you know, autism, it's something that we need to, need to keep, we need to keep discussing. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. So to be continue. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, we Leon. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Leona Maria, for your wonderful work. Thank you, Marina, for your support. Thank you for all the questions um, and all for all the participants. Thank you. So I just put in the in the website. No, I'm sorry, in our chat. Uh, our next activity is also toward the NLS Congress. Thank you, Leon, that you said that. Uh, in, that is the in the July two and third, two, second and third of July fixation and repetition. And our next activity will be at the end of October, October 30th, transfer repetition and iteration in the clinic of the Parletre by Gerardo Requis, that he's a member of LANEL, that is the Caribbean school. And the, uh, also he's member of the Spanish, he moved to Spain, so of the Spanish, of our Spanish school. So I hope to see you in our next activities. Will you have the our two YouTube channel so you can see all the previous activities and thank you so much. I really enjoy it was amazing the work for of today. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.